started the Gospel of Luke, um, just working through it chunk by chunk. Uh, we're going to be going through that for a fair while. We might veer off the path here and there, but we will get back on it and press on until we've chipped away and we've gone through that entire book. Uh, uh, you'll remember that um, <clears throat> Luke, who is a, uh, or was a doctor and a historian, has gathered um, in, in great detail, at great length, details about Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, and details about salvation. Uh, and he wrote to this man called Theophilus, uh, who was uh, some guy of high social standing, much higher than me, and uh, Theophilus wanted him, wants certainty about Jesus Christ and salvation. So that is why, uh, the main reason why Luke is writing. Uh, so before we get into that, um, let's pray. Dear Father, we know that um, all things are in your hands. We know that ultimately you are over all and in control of all. And we thank you. And we thank you that you are unchanging and that you are trustworthy and good and righteous in all your ways. Father, we want to hear from your word today in, in a way that uh, reveals more of you, that strengthens our faith, that um, causes faith to rise. And uh, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will uh, lead us, guide us and transform us to be more like your son. And so be with me now as I proclaim your word and uh, help me to do that, to glorify your name. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this passage, um, it really is pretty awesome, right? It's, it's a pretty outstanding passage, right? It, and one thing it does is it screams out about grace and glory and power and belief. The more you sit in it, the louder those notes become. It's about the grace of the Father, the glory of the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the belief of a servant. Grace, glory, power, and belief. That's where we are today. This passage is, is about a young girl, perhaps 14 years old or so. A girl who God the Father chooses to pour out His grace upon. It's also about the promise of a glorious son that she's going to give birth to. And it will be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this young girl, she's about to hear some promises of God. And uh, despite the difficulties and the challenges of those promises, she's going to trust him completely. We're going to see faith in action. Grace, glory, power and belief. Have a look at verse 26. And 27. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man na uh, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, as Carissa mentioned, this story continues on from last week. Uh, I could say that every week because we're just moving through the book. Um, but You'll remember that the, the angel Gabriel, uh, he, he showed up in the temple to Zechariah, the priest, um, while he was burning incense in there. And, um, you know, this angel comes, he comes to Zechariah, shows up and says, your wife's going to have a baby, uh, call him John. He's going to be one of the greatest guys who'll ever live because he's going to turn people back to God. And his, his job will be to make people ready to meet the saviour of Israel and to meet the saviour of the world. And now we're, we're six months down the track now, seven weeks in our time, six months in the gospel story, and uh, we zoom into this little town of Nazareth. Could you pop up the map picture if it's, the, if it's available? 
please. Thanks, Gavin. Right. Nazareth. Probably hard to see from there. Bam. There it is there. Off to the side, sort of, you know, down the middle of nowhere, really. Um, it is a little town. And uh, the population at the time uh, is estimated like maybe 500 to 1,000-ish sort of people. And uh, it, like I said, it's not a main city. Nazareth is sort of kicked out to the side. Um, it's, it's, it's a nowhere town, really. There's nothing much to see there. Um, you know, it's out to the side. The Jews there weren't considered um, very um, kindly by other Jews. They were sort of outcasts, I suppose you could say. And um, it just wasn't really spoken highly of. You know, you wouldn't go and book your family holiday in Nazareth at this point in time. That's kind of the feel, right? But God chooses to work in different ways than what people expect. And uh, we'll see this more and more and more as we go through the Gospel of Luke. But God decides he wants to put Nazareth on the map. And uh, so what he does is sends an angel there. And uh, he sends Gabriel again to deliver a message to this virgin named Mary. And now she's engaged to a bloke named Joseph. And Joseph is a uh, descendant of King David. These are the details that Luke gives us, right? Gabriel sent by God to deliver good news to the Virgin Mary. Look at verse 28 to 30. And he came to her, this is Gabriel, and said, Greetings, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. God has sent a, a message to Mary, who in the eyes of the world is an unimportant girl in an unimportant town. But the message is to let her know that that she has been chosen by God. She's been chosen by God and that God is with her. God the Father wants to pour out His grace upon uh, Mary, blessing her with a child. Now Mary doesn't seem to be as uh, terrified as Zechariah uh, was when the angel showed up, but she does seem to be baffled and a bit, um, you know, she's racking her brain to try and understand well, what's the go? Why is there an angel talking to me and what's he on about? You know, there's some challenge there. You know, I picture Mary sitting down at the kitchen table with a cuppa and a scone and, uh, you know, bam, next minute there's an angel uh, rocking up. The same angel, mind you, who terrified, you know, a priest in the temple of God just a few months ago. That same one rocks up and um, I reckon I'd be terrified, eh? to be honest, because I'm, uh, as we go through, I'm starting to get the feeling that Gabriel doesn't use a doorbell. You know, he kind of just, <laughs> bam, he's there, you know, um, freak you out. It'd be freaking, it'd be terrifying, right? Uh, even so, the, the message that he has for Mary isn't terrifying. Uh, it's actually terrific news. It's, it's not terrifying, it's terrific. It, if, an angel, if an angel ever rocks up at your place, these are the words that you want to hear. Greetings, O favoured one. The Lord is with you. That's what you want to be hearing. Don't be afraid, for you have found favour with God. And whatever follows after that, in one sense, it doesn't really matter. Because you know, if God chooses to pour out his grace upon someone, it's going to be good. Um, you know, Whatever it is, it, it's going to be good. It, it might be hard. But it's still going to be good if God chooses to pour out his grace upon somebody. So when he calls Mary, O favoured one, he's basically saying, it basically means, O one who is highly blessed. One who is highly blessed. Mary, you have been blessed by God. He has chosen you. You've been picked. Some of us have never been picked for anything in our life. 
Mary's been picked by God. Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. Don't stress out. You have found the grace of God. Now soon the angel's going to tell us more about this um, great blessing and grace, but uh, he begins by making sure that Mary knows that this, has, this message has come from God himself, you know, that he's, he's not a phony, she's not hallucinating from the heat, it's not an angel of darkness masquerading as an angel of light, it's legit, it's a, it's a message from God the Father. Uh, a message that begins by saying, God is blessing you, he is with you. You have found favour with God. Now, I'm not sure if there's any better words you could possibly hear, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure if there's any more comforting or exciting words that somebody could hear. Except maybe words like these. Your sins have been forgiven. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come, your soul can have rest with me. Enter my kingdom. Enter the joy of my kingdom. Words like this, this is what you want to hear, right? These are the words that you want to hear. But you'll never ever hear them if you don't ever turn from your sin. You will not hear them. You must repent and turn from your sin and trust in Christ for salvation or you'll never hear those words. At the end of your life, you'll only ever hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Come by faith to Jesus. Come by faith to Jesus because without him you'll perish forever. That's the stern, clear message of the Bible. And some might say, oh, I didn't get an angel. I didn't have a special message. He hasn't chosen me. But an angel is a messenger. That's what an angel is, a messenger of God. And so is a preacher. So is a preacher. And as long as what is being said aligns with the word of God, with the scripture, then the grace of God is near. Because God has sent a messenger with good news. That Jesus the Saviour has come so that you don't have to die in your sins and perish. God has done something. If you've heard the gospel message, the, the grace of God is knocking at your door, but you've got to receive it by faith. By faith. This is the favour and grace of God, the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. There's the grace of God. The Father is so gracious that he would send his only glorious son to die on a cross to pay for our sins in full. Raise him back to life. This is the grace of the Father that he chooses and invites people in to have their sins forgiven. And have eternal life with him. And God's grace can reach anywhere, whether it's Nazareth or Ningi, Nambor or any other place starting with N. The grace of the, the, grace of the Father is not bound by anything. Nothing at all. No cultural boundaries, no state borders, nothing. Race, gender, no front doors, no back doors, no brick walls, nothing. And he's willing to pour out his grace and his favour and his blessings and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness in great measure for all those who simply trust in Christ for salvation alone. And if that's you, then you have found favour with God. And God is with you. And your sins are forgiven. And you are in his kingdom. Right? This is the grace of God. 
This is the grace of God. That's the grace of the Father. And now in verse 31 to 33, we hear about the glory of the Son. Verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He, he'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Well, thanks, Gabriel. You, you've, you've told us that Mary is favoured by God, um, but what for? What for? Here's, here's the content of his message. Um, God's grace shows up in his son. Right, the glorious son named Jesus, a glorious and great son of the most high God. And this glorious son will be a king from the line of David. And this glorious son will rule and reign over Israel. And this glorious son will have a kingdom that will not ever end. It will never end. Now, some young ladies have... Um, get a bit overwhelmed just choosing what to wear for the day. But could you imagine how overwhelming this message might have been to a young girl? You put yourself in her position. You know, you put a, just put aside the whole terrifying random angel thing and um, the content of this message alone is pretty enormous. It's weighty, right? It's, it's a big deal. R.C. Sproul, um, famous theologian, said... This woman had the most holy task of any woman in, in history. Big deal. Big deal. This young lady, Mary's just been told she's having a baby and to call him Jesus and that he's the son of God. Um, and the grace of God is upon Mary for this reason, to carry and give birth to and take care of this glorious son of God. What a task. What pressure, I suppose. God has fulfilled a promise here. Right? Isaiah chapter 7, hundreds of years before this event, Isaiah the prophet said, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the Gospel of Matthew, it confirms that and tells us a little more. It says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord spoken by the prophet Isaiah. The baby in her womb is Jesus, the holy Son of God, the Son of God, the promised King, and he will save his people from their sins. This baby is Emmanuel, God with us. He is fully God, but also as Mary's very own child, at the same time, he's going to be fully human. For everyone who likes juicy theological terms, that's a hypostatic union. Go have fun with that and read about that. Bend your brain for a while. Fully God, fully man, simultaneously. God remains himself while taking on full humanity. The claim of the Bible is this, that Jesus is God in human form. Now, what about old Joseph? Right? Um, he isn't going to strictly be the father of Jesus, uh, but he'll still be recognised as the legal father of Jesus. Joseph is the earthly father. This makes Jesus a descendant of David because uh, Joseph is a descendant himself. Which also makes Jesus the fulfilment of God's covenant promises from very, very long ago. Um, he's the fulfilment of that to set a king to rule over Israel forever. So Mary's baby is going to be a king. And this baby Jesus will save his people from their sins and King Jesus will reign forever. 
This is the glorious Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who rules the universe with full authority. Full authority. This baby will be the one that every human being will give an account to at the end of their life. Though he won't be such a cute little baby at that point. This king rules with perfect justice. He's full of grace and mercy. This is Jesus, the king of eternity. Do you know him? Is he your king? Thanks. It was getting chilly up here. <laughs> it's unusual. See, we need to understand who Jesus is. He's not simply a great man, great teacher, great guy. Um, he's the glorious son of God. The son of God. Well, we must learn to recognize and submit to uh, Jesus as the great king, great lord, great master and great saviour. That's who he is. And if you know him personally as these things, the grace of God is upon you. You have found favour with God and he is with you. He's with you. Well, this is glorious news. This is the promise of eternal life. Life with the glorious Son of God. So the Virgin Mary is going to have a baby. How is it going to happen exactly? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, it's infertile. For nothing will be impossible with God. I reckon Mary asks a fair question here, eh? How is this going to be since I'm a virgin? Fair question. She believes it's going to happen. Just wondering how, you know. Um, and the angel says the Holy Spirit's going to do it. That's the way. He also says, oh, and by the way, in case you didn't see on Instagram, Elizabeth, your relative, is preggers too. She's had her scans, right? She's in her second trimester. She's six months pregnant. Um, even though she's really old and couldn't have Children, God has done an amazing thing and it's going to happen to you too. See, the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. Nothing is impossible for Him. He was there at the foundation of the earth, there at the creation of the world. And so the conception of Jesus is going to be quite different. Uh, it's something only God could bring about, something miraculous, not some kind of strange physical intercourse thing that some twisted people have conjured up and thought about way too much. It's true. But the Holy Spirit will basically make baby Jesus show up in the womb uh, from a tiny fetus all the way to full term and on from there. It's, it's purely a God thing. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jesus will be called Holy. He's not born with a sinful nature, but he's perfectly pure and holy and righteous. Um, we know that Jesus knew no sin, did no sin, had no sin. He's the perfectly holy Son of God. This is Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate, God in the flesh, the glorious Eternal Son of God taking on full humanity by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now to us this might sound absolutely nuts, crazy. Uh, we tend to get stumped over a lot of these things. But nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible with God. Whatever God says will happen, happens. If he makes a promise, it's guaranteed. Uh, what God says always becomes a reality in his timing. Nothing is impossible with God. 
His Holy Spirit is powerful and able to do the things that we just can't even imagine. People often think very little of God's power, but let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it came into existence. Is it too hard for the creator of the world, the designer of the human body, to give himself a body? And is it too hard for him to put that body into a womb that he designed and made himself? Absolutely not. Nothing is impossible with God. And here's the most impossible thing that I can think of, but God can do it. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, God takes sin-loving sinners and totally transforms them to love righteousness. God, this is, this is the most impossible thing I can think of. Right? That, that a sinner would begin to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. Impossible apart from the power of God. I know it firsthand. Jesus says you must be reborn. You need to be recreated. You need to be made new spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, John 3. The power of the Holy Spirit changes a person to make them a brand new creature. The power of the Holy Spirit is incredible. He can bring the death from he can bring life out of death. He can make a barren woman and a virgin have children and even change people like us to love Jesus. And if this is true of you, then you know the power of God and the grace of God is upon you and you have found favour with God and He is with you. He's with you. So far we've seen the grace of the Father, the glory of the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit. And to end, we look at the belief of a servant and we'll move into communion. Verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And to be uh, betrothed or engaged in this culture was far more binding than what we know in our culture, right? Um, for Mary to be engaged to Joseph, it's as if they were married already. Um, though they weren't married formally, uh, that engagement was so binding that a divorce would have to take place to end it. Uh, and it's possible to miss the faith of Mary here because uh, she's totally accepted the fact that she's going to uh, fall pregnant, but not by Joseph, her husband, but by the Spirit of God. And we know that from Matthew's Gospel that when Joseph found out she was pregnant, he was going to divorce her quietly, uh, just as low-key as possible. Now, the big deal is this. At this time, um, the death penalty was still in place for adultery. And uh, so it's very possible that Mary could have suffered and died for having this baby. But she chooses to trust God's word anyway. She says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, not my will, but yours be done, is what she's saying. She's willing to give everything based on God's promises. And if you're a Christian, you and I must learn to give everything based on God's promises. He's the eternal king. We are his servants. So we need to learn to say with the dear mother of Jesus, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We can hear the echo of Mary's words from the mouth of her son. About 30 years later, Jesus would be arrested 
falsely accused, savage, savagely beaten, um, flogged, crucified. And worst of all, he would bear the sin of the world on, on a cross. He would become the perfect sacrifice to pay for the sin of the world so that we could be forgiven. Before he was arrested, though, he was praying, praying with full trust. You'll probably remember these words of Jesus as he's in the garden. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Remove what's coming. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Full trust, despite the circumstances. Now, this can be a hard prayer for us. So we need the grace of God and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us live fully for, for King Jesus, fully committed, 100% committed to the point where we can say, let it be to me according to your word. It's to the point where we can wake up each morning and earnestly, honestly pray to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. Yours be done today. Thank you.